Respiration at the medulla. What you want to do is control ventilation to control the blood gas CO2, partial pressure of CO2, PCO2 should be about 40. Okay, in, the, in arterial blood, if it changes too much from that, you, um, you affect breathing to either uh, exhale it, or e to either increase or decrease the value from 40. So, the condition of too much CO2 in the arterial blood is hypercapnia, and hypocapnia is too little. Now, the reflex mechanism for controlling breathing has to do with um, the trigger. Let's say, for example, in arterial blood, let's say it gets too high. Let's say it gets around 45 millimeters of mercury. That can be detected in a couple of ways. In the fluids or in the blood, you have central and peripheral chemoreceptors. The central chemoreceptors are in the medulla, and the peripheral ones are in the same spots where you've got the baroreceptors, the carotid and the aortic arch. Well, anyways, aether impulses will trigger the medulla medullary respiratory centers to um, increase the efferent impulses to the respiratory muscles like the diaphragm. Chemoreceptors. So the efferent activities to, uh, let's say, for example, diaphragm. What we're doing is we're increasing the ventilation. We're increasing the respiratory rate. That, that's really what we're doing. Think of respiratory rate as breaths per minute. Well, that should re-regulate you back to around 40. It's tightly regulated to keep it at 40. You want to do that because um, if PCO2 gets too high, it can affect the pH. A drop in pH is, is a disaster for the brain because the acidosis um, in the brain, well, there's no buffers to correct it. So that's why you want to keep the arterial CO2 at around 40. So if normal is 40, if you reach 45, you're going to double the ventilation rate. However, the reverse is true. 
if hypocapnia occurs, you might faint, you might pass out, because CO2 is a dilator in the brain, and so if its levels become too low, you observe vasoconstriction in the brain, and then when you pass out, you stop breathing. And that allows CO2 to accumulate, and you come to, you wake up. Okay? So to correct that, um, to correct hyperventilation, let's say the cause is hyperventilation. You breathe off too much CO2, you just pass out. So before you pass out, you know, if you're standing by, just kind of catch the person. Don't let them fall and hit their head. Just, you know, let's sit them down, have them rebreathe their own expired air, say from a paper bag or something. Okay. And um, <coughs> that helps. CO2 is a dilator in the brain. Now, it turns out um, O2 we think it is the more important one, therefore that should be more tightly regulated. But because you have this huge hemoglobin reservoir, you really don't need to regulate it that much because it's circulating bound to hemoglobin. Well, look at it this way. If you drop from 100 to 60, then you might notice a change. Okay, Because um, if you need more O2, the hemoglobin can just drop it off. When we say deoxygenated blood, it's really, it's not unoxygenated, it's still about 75% oxygenated. Okay, so you have a huge reservoir there. So the regulation of O2, not as tightly regulated. Another topic is called anatomic dead space. Now this is the space um, of the conducting airways. It's just the air sitting in conducting airways and it's not available for gas exchange. So if we symbolize the respiratory system as this flask again, and picture in your mind, let's say 500 ml, fresh air. That's the volume of air you're going to breathe in. You know, not all of that 500 reaches the alveolar spaces. Let's say maybe 350 does. And it reaches this space. This is the space. That's available for gas exchange. That's the alveolar space. But the space of the conducting airways, like the large bronchi, let's say 150 sits in there, and it's not available for gas exchange. That's the dead space volume, about 150. So if you want to calculate what's called the alveolar ventilation rate, that's the fresh air that actually reaches those spaces. They call it V sub A with that little dot over it. Um, so if the 150 is the dead space volume, you can subtract that out. You can have non-functional alveoli, and that will be considered alveolar dead space. We won't consider that in our problems. Let's just kind of talk about dead space and how it can lead to uh, suffocation. If we reduce the ventilation below that of dead space volume, there's basically no alveolar ventilation rate. So let's, let's say, for example, a snorkeling tube had a volume of 350, and the dead space is 150. If tidal volume is 500, basically none of that is fresh air reaching the alveoli. Okay. Theoretically, there is alveolar ventilation, but it's being ventilated with stale air. 
So consequently, a, a swimmer could suffocate. So how you can calculate that out is always subtracting dead space volume from tidal volume. The volume of air you actually breathe in minus the air sitting in uh, the conducting airways, not available for gas exchange. Okay. So that's what they mean by dead. Not available for gas exchange. I mean, nothing's really dead. Unless you actually do that snorkeling tube thing and all you breathe is dead space air, then actually you actually would die. Okay. So that's why you can't uh, sit at the bottom of a swimming pool and breathe through a garden hose. Are you getting any fresh air? Maybe for one breath, because the air in the hose is fresh air, but then once you take one breath, that's probably it. So let's do the top one, sitting down. If you subtract out the dead space volume, just go 500 ml minus 350, I'm sorry, minus 150 equals 350. So I just subtracted out the dead space volume, that 150. Right there. TV, tidal volume, that's the 500. That's the amount you're actually inhaling, inspiring into your system. But 350 ml per breath, that's actually what is reaching the alveolar spaces. So if you multiply that by the respiratory rate for doing the top one, let's say 15, and you just cross out the common units. Um, so 350 times 15 <coughs> should give you that number. thousand two fifty mils per minute. That's the actual alveolar ventilation rate. Five point two five liters per minute per minute given <coughs> these things. So what you can see conceptually is it's better to take slower but deeper breaths. Even though the, the frequency of breathing is about a quarter of thirty because you're ventilating so much better, um, the, the alveolar ventilation rate is significantly better. So for example, um, questions for you. We got a couple of situations. Actually, they're, they're, they're both the same problem. There's only one minor difference in the second one. So let me set the top one up for you. Uh, if I want you to calculate this, alveolar ventilation rate, the ABR. I gotta give you some things. In this example, I, I tell you that Sarah's ABR during mild exercise is about six. Six liters per minute. So let's say she's jogging on a warm summer day on the beach, and I ask you, what's her respiratory rate? What's it gotta be to maintain that six, okay? And I give you the, the tidal volume and the dead space volume, the typical 500, 150. So how you can set that up is um, well, I won't even erase that. <clears throat> Just subtract out the dead space volume in calculating ABR. It, it's still 350. I want to convert that to liters. 0 0.350 liters per breath. With each breath, that's how much fresh air is reaching the alveolar spaces during her job. And I'm, the question is, how many, what's the respiratory rate? That's breaths per minute. What's that got to be to maintain 6.0 liters per minute? So I'll multiply that times some unknown number of breaths, call it X, per minute, will give you 6.0 liters per minute fresh air 
reaching the alveolar spaces, it's got to be 6. So you just do the uh, equation. You multiply it along with this way. Divide both sides by uh, 350.350 liters per breath. So I'll isolate my x, my unknown. So this cancels out. So I want to continue up here. So x number of breaths per minute will equal uh, our 6 liters per minute times, I'm going to flip that, breaths. So I did that, I write my liters, cancel out, and then uh, my x is going to be 6 divided by 350. Yeah, about 17. Uh, roughly 17 breaths per minute. I round it down, but the point is, okay, if that's how you do that, well, let's read the next problem. The only thing that's different is, now she's snorkeling, everything else is the same. She still needs to maintain 6.0 liters per minute, but now she has a dead, she's adding a dead space of 50 because of the snorkel. Okay. So the question is, well now, um, what's a respiratory rate have to be now? Well just conceptually, without doing the math, do you have to breathe more or less if you increase the dead space volume? the breathing rate will have to increase. You can calculate it out, but when you do that, what are you going to change here? You're going to add 50 to this, and then you just do the same calculation. So that's all that is. Now, in preparation for Friday's lab, I'm going to go right into the slides, the file that's titled Spirometry, because uh, that lab is, we're going to, we're going to start with that on, uh, on Wednesday. So I want to make sure you're ready for that. Like you did the, the ECG with the bio patch, now we're going to just do a different setup with the same equipment. So this time it's spirometry. A spirometer can measure uh, changes in lung volume. The max volume of airways in an adult is about five to six liters. And uh, the respiratory physiologist, there, there's a defined set of volumes and capacities that we have students measure. And we even have some clinical assessments that you can make. And the question and answers. The question we like to answer is how well can a subject move air in and out of your lungs? And then so you'll be working in uh, eight groups and try to some. Well, don't try. Have two subjects in your group. And it's good to do two so you can kind of compare one to the other. <coughs> I even say in the lab procedures, one, one student is normal, one is you know chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. I don't suspect anyone actually has that, but you can just, if you want to volunteer information, oh yeah. I, I used to live in Mexico City. I, I used to be a smoker. Anything that might make you be a, a, a patient with a, a poor or spiral, <coughs> um, you're free to volunteer that information and be a subject. If you can just get two people to volunteer to be subjects, that's all we really ask for. But uh, the setup is um, shown here. You always calibrate, and this is a very important step. Don't gloss over it. If you do it incorrectly, your numbers are going to be off. And they show that um, you calibrate with a syringe. The syringe is an air pump. You put both hands on the air pump. There's a filter there. And then you like put this. This is the machinery that costs us a lot of money to take care of it. Don't, don't be like putting one hand here and then one hand on the plunger. Because then you're going to generate all kinds of torque. And we have broken all of our syringes. Okay, every single one of them, because students don't do this part correct. That, and that's not an exaggeration. We've ordered double the number because you keep breaking them. <laughs> so I'll, I'll remind you again on Wednesday. Put both hands on the syringe and you won't like, tear any of the plastic here. It's got to be a tight seal. <clears throat> on the subject, you're wearing a nose clip. And the filter is very important. Um, it, it keeps the airflow transducer clean, but also if there are any germs on there, it protects you. 
Okay. So protect yourself and protect the airflow transducer. What you can't see from the picture is there's a metal diaphragm in there. It's like mesh, and air can flow past it, and it can detect. It's got hard. It's hard wired. It can detect the volume of airflow that's flowing past it. And when you get the read on the computer screen, it looks something like this top-looking spirogram. <coughs> Both subjects, the, pre the procedure is breathe in, breathe out. So one breath looks like a little hill. Okay. Just do it like five times. Five normal breaths, in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. And then take a super deep breath in and blow it all the way out as fast as you can. Super deep breath in, super deep breath out, and then another five normal breaths. And that's a spiral breath. So the data doesn't take long to collect. And all you got to do is just measure the thing. The computer makes it really easy. Okay. Um, all right. So these volumes and capacities are shown in this table here. This first one is called the tidal volume. The tidal volume. Like the tide coming in and out every day. Yeah, it's like you breathing every day. You never stop. It just goes in and out. And so if you take any of these normal breaths and just measure from top to bottom, say there to there, call that number one. That's our tidal volume. TV. I won't even write it out. You've got the table right there. Tidal volume. If you measure from the top of a normal breath in to the top of your deep breath, you have some reserve, right? Number two, you call that the IRV. The IRV is your inspiratory reserve volume. A normal breath is about 500 ml for a man and for a woman. But when you start res uh, measuring your max levels, the average adult male typically has a little bit larger lung capacity. So their IRV might be about 3 liters, and for a female might be close to 2 liters. And you'll see what it is for your subject. If you breathe all the way out and then gasp, that extra amount of air you gasp out is the difference between the bottom of a normal breath to the very bottom of all the air you could possibly get out. And that is referred to as your ERV, your expiratory reserve volume. It's usually a little bit less. It's actually much less than the IRV. It's easier to de breathe deeply than it is to kind of push all the air out because your lungs are stuck to the chest but you should have about a liter of ERV, okay? And then there's a volume of air that you just cannot get out because the lung is stuck to the chest wall. The only way you can get it out is if you collapse your lung. So this difference here between the bottom of your ERV to the bottom, 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 I guess, is your RV, number four. The residual volume. The air that always resides in your lung, no matter what, because you, the lung is stuck to the chest. That's like, if you reside there, you live there, you're not leaving. Right? So there's always a volume of air in your lungs that you can't get rid of. Now, we can take some of these volumes and uh, measure capacities. The capacities are a sum of different volumes. You can see how they kind of add them up here. For example, they have... The TLC, the total lung capacity, is just from top to bottom. From top all the way to bottom. Call that number one. Total lung capacity. You just add everything up. You add the VC. Well, I didn't say VC yet, but just it's the whole thing. It's about six liters for a man 
maybe about four liters for a woman. Now, the vital capacity, I would say that's the most important one you measure in this lab because you actually can measure it. You cannot measure total lung capacity because the residual volume, you can't measure it directly, right? Unless you collapse the lung. Well, there are ways you can do it without collapsing the lung, but we don't have those ways. So you can't truly calculate TLC, but you can directly measure VC, vital capacity, from a super deep breath in to pushing it all the way out, you can directly measure that. Okay. So it's very important that the subject gives a real maximal effort breathing all the way in and all the way out. Because if it's like you don't give that max effort, things are going to be squished and you're going to wonder why your vital capacity is lower than average. It may be you just didn't give the max effort. Uh, all right, you can also measure IC. So number two is VC. So IC, inspiratory capacity is from there to there. I'll call that number three. And then number four, uh, FRC. FRC, I, I talked about it before the break. It's kind of like, it's the moment before you take your next breath. So it includes the ERV and the RV. Number four, the functional residual capacity. It does have a function, I'll talk about that later, but this is like a mixing chamber. That's the function of it. You're breathing in and out, but you're not breathing all the air in and then breathing all the air out. There's always a huge volume of air. It's about two and a half liters in a man. That acts as a, the function is a mixing chamber so that as long as you're breathing the fresh air your whole life, your alveolar spaces will always have an oxygen-rich pack of air. So that way, when blood flows by, even if you're taking a breath out, oxygen still enters the bloodstream. That's counterintuitive, right? How could you get oxygen to the blood if you're not breathing in? Because of this. Whether you breathe in or out, there's it's still a big... This big, this big volume of air there. And the breathing that you constantly do is keeping the FRC oxygen rich. You can always get oxygen into the blood and you, you can always allow blood to dump the CO2 no matter if you're breathing in or breathing out. So that's why that, that's an important volume to know about. <laughs> All right, so normal breathing. Um, is good and some pathologies that can hamper the, the gas exchange. Let's remember that's the main cause. They're categorized as either restrictive or obstructive. versus obstructive. All right, restrictive is, um, well, let's read what I have here. The ability of a lung to stretch is compliance. So compliance is a good thing. If you're compliant with breathing, that means you have a lung that's easy to inflate. So we call that a high compliance lung. It stretches easily. A low compliance lung requires more force. Labored, difficult breathing. So that's not good. Your inspiratory muscles have to stretch it a little bit more. Diseases, diseases that decrease lung compliance are the restrictive <coughs> lung diseases. Ventilation is effective because more work must be expended to stretch a stiff lung. So that's basically what it is. Restrictive is, it is difficult 
to inflate stiff lung for whatever reason. I'll kind of go through some of them. Obstructive. Well, there's an obstruction somehow. And, well, normal quiet breathing is like a whoosh. And diseases in which airflow is diminished because of increased airway resistance, those are the obstructive lung diseases. There's an obstruction. When patients forcefully exhale, the air whistles through narrowed airways, causing a wheezing sound that you can hear, you know, even without a stethoscope. So the main uh, thing for the obstructive lung diseases you know, it actually may be um, easy to inflate the lung, but it may be difficult to empty because of the obstruction. It's easier to inflate lung, but difficult to empty. Because it's difficult to empty, you're leaving a lot of stale air in the lung, and so the ventilation is compromised. <clears throat> Let's go through some of the um, causes of restrictive obstructive. Emphysema lung is considered an obstructive lung disease. <clears throat> and look at the pictures, normal versus compromised. So emphysema lung. Emphysema lung um, is considered obstructive. What you're going to have is a, a destruction of the alveolar walls. And so you're producing a smaller number of larger alveoli. Now, larger may sound better, but it's actually not as good because you're decreasing the respiratory membrane. You're re re decreasing the surface area for gas exchange. So let's say, for example, in the normal lung, I count one, two, three, four, five, six normal alveolar spaces. However, this is like one big one, and there's less area for gas exchange, so the oxygen tension is lower. There's less surface area, the lungs are overly compliant, you have a destruction of elastic fibers, so even though the lungs are easy to inflate, they're difficult to empty, because that elastic recoil is compromised, you just can't push the air out of your lungs. So you leave a lot more stale air, further compromising the gas exchange. Here's a picture of emphysema lung, low, higher mag on the right. I mean, it's, you don't think you have to be a doctor to figure out that doesn't look good at all. It doesn't look like anything. It looks like a bunch of junk. That's diseased lung. I mean, junk is not a scientific word, but just the impression I get by looking at it. You see the, the normal structure here of normal lung, and this, everything has been broken down. Looks like a bunch of like random scar tissue. Fibrotic lung disease is categorized as restrictive. Characterized by fibrosis, which is scar tissue, it restricts lung inflation. You get a thickened respiratory membrane that's going to slow the gas exchange, and the loss of compliant decreases the ventilation. It's difficult to inflate a stiff lung. So that's why they draw the thickened respiratory membrane, and this is more difficult to ventilate, so the oxygen tension is low. It's diminished in its uh, gas exchange there. Our pulmonary edema is also considered a restrictive lung disease. Edema is a fluid accumulation in the lungs. Maybe the left heart can't push the blood forward, so the, the fluids get backed up into the lungs. And what you do is you put an increased diffusion distance. And this is surrounded by fluid. It's difficult to inflate this structure if it's submerged in fluid, right? That's why it's considered restrictive. Asthma is your classic obstructive lung disease. So you can see the constricted bronchioles maybe due to uh, bronchospasms. 
The constriction, maybe you can inflate easily, but it's difficult to empty the lung. And um, the airway resistance decreases the alveolar ventilation. Some of the pulmonary function tests we can do, you can just measure the uh, volume of air that the subject is breathing. We kind of calculated that out already. One thing we'll do in the lab on Wednesday is the FEV1, the forced expiratory volume one. The one is one second. It answers the question your, for your subject, how much air can they exhale in one second? In normal healthy lungs, you should be able to push out 80%. So the procedure is you just breathe in all the way, deep breath, and then on the mouthpiece, just blow it all out. In that first second, most of it should have been removed from the lung. It should be 80%. Okay. In normal, young, healthy lungs, I mean, I see like in the mid-90s. This is kind of what it would look like on a graph. You breathe out at time zero. Notice most of it is gone in the first second. Okay, a normal FEV1 is 80% um, is the benchmark. But notice how um, it kind of trails off, gets higher and higher more slowly. This is where your subject is gasping. And how many seconds does it look like they go out to? Five, Five or six. And so remember that. For your subject, if they stop at three, what's your max value going to be? That, but it could be that. But you don't know because they stop short. So be sure they're gasping for five seconds. Count. One, banana, two, banana. Just, hey, do it again. Well, remember that, about five or six seconds. Just push it all out. So that way, your top value is your true vital capacity. Okay. And, and then you can measure it out to a second. They should have pushed out 80%. Now, if you look at the regular spirograms, obstruction, see this long slope? Normally, this should be more straight up and down. But because it's difficult to empty the lungs, it kind of goes out slower. And what you might notice is I would note that FEV1 may be compromised. For, uh, this one here. You just can't empty the lungs normally. See how this one, for a restrictive lung disease, everything is just squished down. Okay, it's like uh, there's no obstruction. But you just can't inflate all the way, all these like shallow breaths. FEV1 may appear normal because there's no obstruction. But I would say the main thing is vital capacity is reduced. For example, if you look at that FEV1 data, if you look um, at the obstructive versus normal, I put a big red line through one second. Because normally, you should push out most of it in the first second. But if there's an obstruction, it'll be much less than 80%. However, if it's a restrictive lung disease, the max value will be just much lower. But you have no problem evacuating the lung. So the FEV1 may be normal. It's, it's really a test for obstructive lung disease. Right? I think that kind of gets us ready for the uh, spirometry lab. But um, you have. Um, on proctorio, a cardio histology quiz, cardio respiratory histology quiz. So I got some slides and I posted them yesterday. Now I'm going to go through them now to make sure you're ready for that quiz. Is, um, perhaps some of you have seen it. When does it do? Tomorrow. Okay, some of you have seen it. It's due tomorrow. It starts with this slide. Let me uh, reset my camera. 